A 17-year-old young woman and her friend went on a trip to Australia and at one point disappeared without a trace. Despite an extensive search and many witnesses, her fate remained unknown for 18 years. When this terrible mystery was finally solved, one shocking fact surfaced. The police had everything they needed to close the case in a matter of days, but their negligence and unprofessionalism stretched it into nearly two decades. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Haley Dodd. Haley Dodd was born on November 30, 1981 in England. When the girl was young, her parents, along with other children, moved to Australia, settling in the small town at Mandura. The young woman was an excellent student, played sports and planned to go to study to be a veterinarian or a school teacher. But before finally deciding on the choice of future profession, she wanted to travel around Australia. Graduating high school in 1999, at the age of 17, she set off on a trip to Western Australia with her best friend, Lisa. Their plan wasn't just to drive through local towns and attractions, but to spend a few months away from home. The young women were going to look for temporary jobs along the way to cover their living, food, and travel expenses. They planned to hitchhike between cities, which in the 1990s in Australia didn't sound like such a dangerous idea. At the time, there had been a number of murders of young women hitchhiking in the country, but compared to the overall number of people hitchhiking safely, these crimes did not cause any mass fear. However, Haley feared that her parents would not allow her to travel that way, even in the company of a friend. For this reason, she assured them that she planned to travel by bus. At the end of July, she and Lisa traveled to a town called Dungara. There, they were going to work as day laborers on a local farm. They were staying at a camping site where they could get a place to sleep for a small fee. Such places are in high demand in Australia, mainly because of their cheapness. A few days before going to work, Haley decided to use the remaining free time and go to a farm to family friends, which was 200 kilometers away. She decided to hitchhike to it, and Lisa didn't want to let her go alone. But Haley insisted she had nothing to worry about and would be back in a few days. To say goodbye, Lisa gave her her folding knife for self-defense and some change so Haley could call her from the phone booth. After saying goodbye, she hit the road at about 8 a.m. Family friends at the farm awaited her arrival, but Haley never showed up. Worried, they called her mother and informed her. The woman feared something might have happened to her daughter, so she immediately called the police. The first thing she did was to dial an emergency number and describe the situation. After listening to her story, the operator thought that nothing urgent had happened, so she advised her to go to the local police department and file a missing person report. So she did. The detectives began their search for Haley, beginning to reconstruct the chronology of events. The first thing they did was arrive at the campsite where Lisa was staying. She was mortified at the news that her friend had never made it to the farm, but the young woman was able to give the police a comprehensive introduction. She accurately described all the clothes Haley was wearing that day and even drew a sketch of the earrings she was wearing for the police. Haley had bought these earrings a few days before the incident. She and Lisa had gone to the store to treat themselves to some inexpensive items, and the young woman was attracted to this jewelry. At that time, she couldn't have imagined that those earrings would be the key to solving this terrible mystery of her disappearance. Detectives disseminated information about the missing young woman along with her description. Although she was almost 18 years old, Haley looked much younger. She was 152 centimeters tall and weighed just over 40 pounds. The police were able to locate the first witness fairly quickly. It turned out to be the truck driver who had given her a ride that day. According to the man's story, she had knocked on his cab window at a gas station and asked for a ride to Mora, a town near where there was a farm. The trucker was on his way to another town but he agreed to give her a ride most of the way. 
the man dropped her off at a turnoff about 50 kilometers from Mora, near the town of Bajangera, where she was to turn off the main road and onto a country road. According to the trucker, Haley was in high spirits, chatting with him the whole way and talking about her journey. After she said she was almost out of money, he gave her $15 so the young woman could buy something to eat. The man also left her his number in case she hitchhiked back. He made trips down that road almost every day and could have let her down again. Later, detectives received several more calls from people who had seen Haley in that area. Based on their statements, police concluded that the young woman had been on foot along the northwest road towards Mora. Apparently, she could not find any driver at the gas station to give her a ride. For this reason, she decided to walk along the road and try to hitch a ride. Based on the testimony of the next witness, he gave Haley a ride to the turnoff on Gunder Do Road, after which she headed further in her direction on foot. The next witness was a woman driving along the road. She spotted Haley just as the young woman was getting out of her car and moving on foot towards Mora. In all, the police were contacted by more than 10 witnesses. After putting their statements together, detectives concluded that the young woman was last seen at about 12 noon on the Northwest Road, about 50 kilometers from Mora. There was another witness, though. He had not seen Haley, but still shared a disturbing observation with police. The man pulled over on the side of the Northwest Road because his engine was overheating. At one point, he heard a dog barking, followed by a piercing female scream. He couldn't see the source of the sound as it might have been far enough away. The road passed through an empty flat area where there was virtually no extraneous noise. With all this information in hand, the police's prognosis was disappointing from the start. Lead detective Eddie Rowe decided that they should look for the body and not consider the possibility that Haley might be alive. But management forbade him to investigate in such a manner, leaving it to the status of the search for the missing person. It's worth clarifying here that a murder investigation would have given the police more options than a missing person investigation, but the police had no leads that could help them get on the young woman's trail, so they quickly set about looking for potential kidnappers. In a short time, they were able to identify several dozen suspects who lived in the area, but eventually the police focused on three men. One worked as a teacher at a local school, another was a part-time gardener there, and the third lived not far from where Haley disappeared. When questioned, each of them pleaded not guilty and provided alibis. The police could not conclude with certainty of their innocence, but they could not find any evidence to the contrary. But soon, the situation changed dramatically. The investigators were approached by a neighbor of one of the suspects a 43-year-old school gardener named Francis Wark. He told them that the day Haley disappeared, Francis borrowed his car to go shopping in Mora. When the man returned home around 1 p.m., a neighbor noticed damage inside the car. The turn signal knob was broken, and the dashboard also showed signs of impact. The neighbor didn't even have time to ask what happened to the car. Francis came home, done with the shopping bags in the kitchen, got on his motorcycle, and drove off. This story seemed strange to the police, and they decided to re-interview Francis. The man said that at the time of Haley's disappearance, he was many kilometers away from the alleged place of her abduction. According to his story, after returning home, he immediately went to a party in the city of Perth on his motorcycle. But he was not supposed to get there that day. On the way there, he exceeded the speed limit and had a serious accident that took him to the hospital. The information available was enough for the detectives to ask the perfectly logical question. Where was he going in such a hurry? His own testimony seemed very strange and investigators decided to apply for a search warrant of his home. The officers searched his residence, but they were unable to find any potential evidence. They also searched the car and removed the seat covers so that experts could examine them in the lab. Unfortunately, 
None of this yielded any results, and Francis was left alone. Almost immediately after that, he moved to the other side of the country, to Queensland, and the detectives were left empty-handed, and the case went into a long drawer. They tried to find new witnesses and evidence to move the investigation forward, but to no avail. This went on for eight whole years, until Francis came back on the police radar in 2007. At the time, he was living in a remote outback in a small settlement. One morning, an elderly couple who lived next door to him were sitting on the porch of their house. At some point, they noticed with horror that a young woman with absolutely no clothes was running in their direction, and her head was covered with blood. She asked for help, and the residents of the house called the police. The victim said that she had tried to catch a ride the night before. A man stopped in front of her and offered her a ride. At one point, he told her, he needed to go to a place to get gas and fill up his car. They drove up to a house in the middle of nowhere, and he called the woman inside and offered her some tea. Unfortunately for her, she said yes. Almost immediately thereafter, he attacked her, and after a brief struggle, tied her up. For the next few hours, the victim was subject to indescribable torture and violence. Her assailant also tore off one of her earrings and took it for himself. As you may have guessed, this man was Francis. By morning, the woman realized that she could get the rope off her hands and then free her legs and run. She loosened the rope, waited for the right moment for Francis to move as far away as possible, and rushed to the back door of the house. Before she left, she removed her pendant and tossed it under the bed. The woman feared that the police might not find any corroboration of her story, so she decided to leave some personal item in his house, and it really worked. The police searched Francis's house, found the very same pendant, and arrested the man. At the trial, he quickly realized that he could not get away with it and decided to confess to what he had done. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. The police in Western Australia, who handled the Haley Dodd case, were notified of Francis' arrest, but they did not appear to be at all interested. No action was taken by the detectives to revive the eight-year-old case, which was so closely resembling the circumstances of Francis's crime. Only through the insistence of Haley's mother did the detectives agree to reopen the case, but they quickly concluded that there was still no evidence against Francis, which meant there was nothing they could do about it. All these years, Haley's family tried to get the police to investigate thoroughly, but they assured them that they had done everything in their power. Desperate to wait for help from law enforcement, the relatives spent tens of thousands of dollars on private investigators, but all to no avail. The case did not take a new turn until six long years later, in 2013, when an extremely outrageous fact came to light. It turned out that the police had simply forgotten about the evidence that ended up being the key to the case. The medical examiner, Tracy Horn, filed a request to reopen the investigation. The reason was that the very same car seat covers seized from Francis's neighbor's car in 1999 were found in evidence storage. Suddenly, it turned out that for 14 years, they had never been tested for blood, DNA, and other evidence. When experts did retrieve them, they were immediately able to find a woman's earring that had snagged on the fabric of the covers. Taking a drawing of Lisa's, which she drew for the police just after her friend's disappearance, detectives were horrified to see. It was the same earring that Haley was wearing the morning of her disappearance. But that wasn't all. A human hair was found in one of the car mats that had also been removed from the car. Experts extracted a DNA sample from it that showed a match to Haley Dodd's mother's DNA. That meant that the hair was very likely Haley's own, but that probability was not 100%, which made it very difficult to prosecute Francis in the shortest possible time. As soon as the news leaked to the media, a wave of criticism poured in against the police. For 14 years, this evidence lay literally under the noses of the investigators, but in all that time, they never remembered it. 
Of course, such a find instantly changed the course of the case, and the detectives went to the other side of the country to interrogate Francis again. At the time, he was still in prison for assaulting a woman in 2007. The man gave them the same story he had told them 14 years earlier. He denied his involvement and assured them that he was shopping in Mora at the time of Haley's abduction. The interrogation, which lasted nearly four hours, was inconclusive, so the police had to prepare the case to go to trial. It wasn't until 2015 when he was formally charged with Haley's murder and deported to Western Australia. Two more years later, in late 2017, the trial began. Francis's defense insisted that all the evidence presented was circumstantial. The earring Haley bought at a local store was very cheap and popular, so it could have been left in the car by another woman. The hair found in the car showed an almost 100% match to Haley's DNA, but not an absolute exact match. Although a mistake here would have been highly unlikely, that was enough for the lawyers, but all these arguments seemed unconvincing to the judge. Perhaps Francis would still have had a chance to get away with it if not for his crime in 2007. But then, he didn't just kidnap a woman who was hitchhiking, he also took her earring. The prosecution believed that the man was collecting the victim's earrings as trophies, which only increased the suspicion against him in the end. As a result, the judge found him guilty of kidnapping and murdering Haley Dodd, sentencing him to 21 years in prison. All of this took place while his previous sentence was still pending. Francis was 62 years old at the time of his sentencing, but the story did not end there. The court believed Francis kidnapped and killed Haley, then hid her body, but it was never found, and the man himself refused to plead guilty. Haley's mother repeatedly asked the killer to tell her where he hid the body, but to no avail. And in 2018, she helped pass a new law that says murderers are not eligible for parole if they refuse to reveal the location of their victims' bodies. In 2020, another high-profile event occurred. The court granted Francis appeal to overturn his sentence and scheduled a new hearing. His lawyers again tried to insist that the man would not have had time to kidnap Haley between his trip to Mora and his return home, but the court felt that the time frame allowed him well enough to do so, especially given the rush with which he arrived home and immediately set off for Perth on his motorcycle. Moreover, the earring, along with the hair, were still on the list of key evidence against him, but Francis still managed to get his sentence changed. The court found him guilty of involuntary manslaughter, reducing his sentence from 21 years to 18 years. But thanks to a law passed in 2018, he would not be able to go free, even after that time, if he refused to identify the location of the body. There is another point in the whole story that keeps the detectives busy to this day. They are sure that many more women have become victims of Francis and that none of them managed to escape. This maniac could have been picking up young women on the roads for decades and what happened to them next only he knows. One of the most likely similar cases is the disappearance of a woman in late 2005. She hitchhiked to another city and was never seen again. The detective handling the case is certain that Francis kidnapped her because he knew the victim personally, but there is no evidence at this time. Perhaps the police will find it again in their warehouse a few years later, but it won't make a difference to the perpetrator. If the police had examined the car more thoroughly, Francis would have been arrested back in 1999. Now we can only guess how many lives he ruined in the ensuing years, but sooner or later, the mystery may be solved. There's another creepy thing about this whole story. Remember that in the initial stages of the investigation, the police identified three main suspects, including Francis? Now, one of them killed his wife five months after Haley disappeared and the other, who worked as a school teacher, turned out to be one of the worst child molesters in Australian history. Too bad the police had no way to stop them at the time. If you liked this video, 
Don't forget to support the channel with a like and share your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching.